The Lord Jesus, uh, teaching on what the kingdom of God would be like, shared this parable found in Matthew chapter 25. Listen to these words. Again, this is referring to the kingdom of God. It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold had gained two more, and the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought another five. Master said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now the tone of the parable changes drastically. Listen to what happens next. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would, not have, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever ha- has will be given more, and they'll have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hear this. God demands of his people a passionate, courageous following. Did you hear that? God demands of his people, that would be you and me, that we follow him with a passion and a courage. Inaction and laziness, apathy, they're not okay, they're not acceptable. And if we follow the Lord in that way, we'll suffer consequences. This is even spoken about in Revelation chapter 3 as uh, the churches of that time were being addressed. Listen to this. I know your deeds, talking to Laodicea, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. The dispassionate, the disconnected, the apathetic, sometimes we call them lazy, those who maybe are forever spectators, never participants, God says, I'm not going to tolerate you. These are sobering words, aren't they? And you're going to suffer consequences. I think over the years, the approach of the church has messed a lot of people up. Maybe you've had some of this experience yourself. I think in her zeal and her desire to be winsome and relevant, uh, she's invited people into something that's really not true Christianity. For a long time, the church uh, went to this thing called um, having this attraction model. Come to us. We're going to help you be better at doing life. We're going to have great concerts. We're going to have great ministry for you. Come and we'll serve you. Come and you see the wrongness of that? Come and it's all about you uh, getting served. And what you invite people into, that's what they expect you to continue to be. And unfortunately, such an invitation invites people into what I would call a, a, a cadre of consumerism. The church is about my needs getting met and me being served. But the Lord calls his followers to be contributors, not consumers, who are putting their time and the talents and the treasures at work in the furtherance of the kingdom of God. How are you doing with all this? You happy to be here today? Are you disconnected and lukewarm? If you're honest, you say, hey, I'm a bit disconnected, and I'm a bit lukewarm, and I'm seeing now that God doesn't tolerate that. Is that you? Are you passionate? 
Are you a courageous follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Good morning. It's good to see you here. I need to lighten it up a little bit. You all look shocked. And uh, good morning to you, Watertown. We're glad you're joining us via video. I've been praying for your city, by the way, Watertown, just so you know that. Um, it was eight weeks ago that we began this series on vices and, the, of course, associated virtues. And we've been looking at what is commonly called the seven deadly sins and then the corresponding virtues that, that displace those vices. And we're to the last deadly sin this morning. And, and I've already talked on it some. If you're astute, you probably figured out what it is. The vice we're looking at this morning is slothfulness. Slothfulness. Steve Deneff, who wrote a lot on these deadly sins, says this about slothfulness. Who cares? Yeah, that's the definition of sloth. Who cares? It's the last sin on our list, he says, though some in the early church put it first for the same reason. The sin of sloth or the virtue of courage, which is the opposite of sloth, underscores every other sin and virtue, making them easier. There are times, wrote Dorothy Sayers, when one is tempted to say that the great sprawling lethargic sin of sloth is the oldest and greatest of sins and the parent of the rest. Why? If we are lazy or if we shrink back from trouble, then every other sin will have a heyday. For life without discipline will run to weeds as quickly as a garden does. Only life is much harder to take back. If we are strong, courageous, and disciplined, we will fight through this life with valor, and every other sin will diminish while every other virtue will multiply. Simply put, those who are harder on themselves will find life a little easier. Those who are easy on themselves will find life insufferable. Oftentimes we think of slothfulness or sloth as just being a couch potato. Yeah, it's a lot more than that, though. And I'm going to expand, I hope, your definition of slothfulness this morning. Sloth is being a spectator forever. That's one part of a definition of slothfulness, is being a spectator forever. William Wright, uh, he, uh, White excuse me, wrote a book called Fatal Attractions, and it's a book on the seven deadly sins. I, I found this... This, his, his thoughts on sloth very in- interesting. Here's what he said. He said in Ellie uh, Weasel's novel, The Town Beyond the Wall, Michael, a young Jew who survived the Holocaust, traveled at great personal risk behind the Iron Curtain to his Hungarian hometown. Though his memory burned with images of the soldiers and police who had brutalized him and those he loved, Michael returned to satisfy his curiosity not to seek revenge. In a strange way, he understood the brutality of the executioners and the prison guards. What he did not understand was the man who lived across from the synagogue, the man who peered through his window day after day as thousands of Jews were herded into death trains, reflecting no pity, no pleasure, no shock, not even anger or interest, rather impassive, cold, impersonal dispassion. Just doesn't care. There's a bond, Michael thought, between the brutal executioner and the victim. Even though the bond is negative, they at least belong to the same universe. But not so the spectator. The spectator is entirely beyond us, seeing without being seen, present but unnoticed. He concluded, to be indifferent, for whatever reason, is to deny not only the validity of existence, but also its beauty. Betray, and you are a man. Torture your neighbor, you're still a man. Evil is human, weakness is human, indifference is not. Weasel's anger toward the spectators, not unlike God's response to the people of Laodicea. God could, not, could understand hot, God could understand cold, but lukewarm was out of the question. So what do you think of when I use the word sloth? Somebody laying in a hammock? Too lazy to get out of bed? Watching TV show after TV show? Is that what comes to your mind when you hear this word? The Bible even talks about the one who's so slothful that he won't lift the spoon from his plate to feed his face. I mean that, you know. And that there's nothing erroneous about thinking that that's part of the definition of slothfulness. But get this. Sloth is more than idleness. It is the sin. It is the sin of disconnecting. It is the sin of disconnecting. Sloth is being in a crowd of people in New York City 
and walking by a woman getting beat up. It's disconnection. Sloth is the chemical company who knowingly pours toxic waste into a river or a landfill. Sloth is the well-fed, the well-off, ignoring the needs of the desperation of hunger of their fellow human beings, whether it be in their neighborhood or around the world. It's not that we lack information on what matters in life. We lack initiative to do anything. We just don't care enough to do anything about any of these kinds of things. This disconnection is frequently called apathy, and we're calling it sloth this morning. Let me ask you a question. This isn't going to... I want you to be as uncomfortable as I have been looking at this for a while. So I'm going to ask you a lot of reflection questions this morning. What do you disconnect from? And why? Is it because it's a hard thing you want to have to face up to? Is it demand some things from you you don't want to do? I'm going to tell you something this morning. If that thing has a right and wrong to it and you ought to be doing it and you're not doing it, you're succumbing to the sin of sloth. We don't look at slothfulness that way. We look at it as being a, 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 a lazy person, but it's a lot more than that. So let me define sloth for you this morning. It is a slowness that has an aversion to hard things. It is a slowness that has an aversion to hard things. It's taking the easy way out and being satisfied oftentimes with the trivial of life. It's letting the small, trivial things be what you do life for. It's not doing life as God would have you do life. Let me give you some quotes on slothfulness. Henry Fairley said this, it's hatred of all spiritual things that entail any kind of effort. St. John of the cross said it runs fretfully away from everything that is hard. The more spiritual a thing is, the more frustrating they find it. And then A.W. Tozer said this, one of the greatest foes of Christian is religious complacency. The man who believes he has arrived will not go any further. From his standpoint, it would be foolish to do so. The present neat habit of quoting a text to prove we have arrived may be a dangerous one if in truth we have not actual inward experience of the text. Truth that is not experience is not better than error and may be as fully dangerous. The one who is dealing with sloth sleeps too long in the morning, just can't get going. Now, if you, have, if you work your tail off and you sleep one day a week, good for you. That's good. Amen? If it's seven days a week, not good for you. That's problematic. It's the one who shows up for work and then avoids doing it all day long. <laughs> Do you have anyone you know that does that? It procrastinates. It doesn't make a decision. Pope Gregory said, when we will not do at the right time what we can, before long, when we will, we cannot. Did you hear that? I like that thought. Pope Gregory said, when we will not do at the right time what we can, before long, uh, when we will, we cannot. Inch by inch by inch, the opportunity slips away. Sloth daydreams. Have you ever experienced any of this in your life? Is this expanding your understanding of that term sloth? Now, I want to blow your mind. Uh, hear what I'm about to say. This is bothering me like crazy, and boy, do I like to share stuff when it bothers me. All right? So hear this. The workaholic can be just as slothful, not because he or she won't work, but because they won't decide to do what really matters. Such a one may never pursue the great things that God has for them in their lives because they are so entangled in doing the small and busy working their tails off doing that. Such a one may be overly busy doing that which does not matter. So working hard is not necessarily the opposite of being a slothful person. Amen? The question is, will you tackle 
that which is most important in your life, and will you do so in a relentless way? Amen? That's what God calls us to do. Sloth quits easily. We read about it all the time in the Bible. The rich man, he has this abundant harvest, and he says to himself, you've worked hard. You deserve a break today. Sounds like a McDonald's commercial or something, amen? So I'm going to put up a big barn because I just had an abundance harvest. I'm going to put up this big barn. I'm going to put all my stuff in there, my four-wheelers and my Harley. No, I'm just joking. But my crane and my crop, and I'm just going to take it easy. I'm going to say to self, take it easy. You remember that, right? You remember this teaching. And then the God came to him. He said, you fool. Tonight, I demand your soul of you. And what's going to happen to all your riches? It's going to go to somebody else. Do you think life begins when you retire? I think about that a little bit more. Some of you are smiling. We've been retired for a while. You don't think that, do you? Some people, they're just living for the day they retire, thinking, I can do nothing. That is being slothful. God never says, hey, retire and do nothing. Where do you read that in the Bible? Nowhere. What do you think retirement should look like? I'm not going to answer that question for you. What do you think retirement should look like? Sloth is faintheartedness and unwillingness to get into the battle, to get dirty at times. It's, it's weak and it diminishes. It, uh, it's cowardly and it's easily intimidated. Like has been the case with every vice we've talked about. Now, you remember, this is number seven vice. Last one. We have one more message in the series next week. We wrap it up. But if I come to you and I think, okay, or myself, I say to my, do you ever do self-talk? I was golfing by myself yesterday. I talked a lot. Not about golf either. I talked to myself a lot because it was basically empty, the whole place I was playing. And so, do you ever talk to yourself and say, self, you got these problems? Or do you say, oh, that was pretty good? I do a lot of this self-talk thing when I'm walking along. And I, 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 I think something happens in us when we begin to realize, oh, I got an issue maybe with a, a bit of slothfulness more than I thought I did. I can't just tell myself, get after it now, Stephen. Be diligent. Just get after it. That usually doesn't work very well, does it? You know why? Because that's really not the, the antidote. The way to move from being a slothful person to the corresponding virtue of diligence is, is, is by the means of grace that God has provided for us. Once again, I, I think the picture will show up here magically behind me at some point. Um, but we have this picture illustrating how to move from sloth to diligence, and it's by the means of grace. And the means of grace that God has provided for you and I is this thing called courage. We have to be courageous followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to be courageous followers uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, the, the, the one who is succumbing uh, to slothfulness, I think, has maybe the wrong understanding of life. We think life should be easy and comfortable. Whereas the one who's courageous understands, no, my life isn't about ease or comfort. It's about following hard after God and pursuing his plans. So let me give you a definition of courage. We use words in here oftentimes, and when you think of courage, what do you think? The person that will do the high ropes at some place, the one who will do the long ski jump, right? We think of courage that way. I remember being with my, my, my granddaughter, Emma. Emma's a brilliant girl. She's now almost, she's a senior in high school this year, my granddaughter. Anyway, my oldest one. And we were at, the, at Disney World, and she was, I was going with Emma, because Emma doesn't like the, the scary rides. Um, so I said to her, this was like five or six years ago, I'll just go with you. So we saw every princess ever <laughs> at Disney World. And I didn't know there were that many princesses in Disney World. And she, it, so we went on, and at one point she said to me, Grandpa, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being afraid. And, and I said, I just heard, Emma, that you gave a speech in your class that was so good that your teacher asked you to give it to the, another class. Yeah. And how do you do with public speaking? Oh, I like to do it. I said, you're courageous. Amen? Because I said, the same person that will ride 
on one of these crazy roller coasters would die if they ever had to do a speech in front of another person. Amen? I said, don't let courage be defined by riding a roller coaster. It's bigger than that, and it's more than that. So we have to define what, I, what is meant by being a courageous follower of Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean I just take silly, crazy risks all the time. Here's what it means. Here's what it means when it comes to us as Christians. Courage is sturdiness of the soul, steadfastness of the soul. It's a willingness to run the race marked out for you with perseverance. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And when you pursue that with the sturdiness of your soul, where nothing distracts that, then, my friend, you are a courageous follower of Jesus Christ. Amen? And that displaces sloth in your life. See, we have to have some expectation changes if we're going to be a courageous follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and move away from being one who thinks life is about comfort and ease. First, first of all, that's a wrong expectation. Life is about ease or fun. I like to have fun. Do you like to have fun? Who doesn't want to have fun in here? Because I don't want to hang around with you. I like to have fun. I like to mess around. I, I, I like to sometimes take it easy. There's nothing wrong with those things. But that's not the goal of life. Although you can have a lot of fun doing hard things. Amen? But the goal is not ease or comfort or fun. Whenever I see this retirement junk on TV, I want to throw my TV right out the window. It's all about ease or fun. So do we live for 60, 65, 70 years to have five years or 10 years or 15 years of ease and fun? And then we die? That's terrible thinking, isn't it? The right expectation to have is this. Life is about the pursuit of God and his agenda. So how do you practice courage? How do you pursue God's agenda? We have a video here from uh, one of our own. Her name is Ellie. She attends our church. She has some great insight on how to practice courage in your life. So we're going to watch that right now. So hi, my name is Ellie Vilhauer. I've been going to Grace Point with my family for a little over a year or so. Um, I have a husband and three amazing kids, and we really enjoy it here. I was asked to uh, speak about being courageous, which is a huge um, topic, and I'm excited about that. Courageous to me, um, when I think of it or thought of it, I really thought it was those big moments in life, like in the movies, uh, the hero has to come out and make this courageous um, choice or decision in their life. And uh, looking back at my own life, I'm not sure I had those moments where I had that big life altering thing where I had to step out in Jesus. Um, looking back, I kind of noticed it took those little things like my Bible sitting on my desk to stop, be courageous and open it and read it and then do it. <laughs> so um, that's what courageous means to me. Doing those little things every day that God is calling me to, stopping me from what I want to do or things that I know I'm supposed to be doing, but God's calling me to do something different. And so when I stop and I do that and become faithful, I learn that I was being courageous. I think that taking the time to be courageous in the little things gives us those moments when God does call us for the big, hairy, scary, courageous moments, that it makes it easier to trust in Him, that we know that having been faithful in these little moments, that we, um, that He has given us just love and, and rewards, if that's what you want to call it. Um, but so when I do get to those big, scary, courageous moments that I can step into it, knowing that he's there, A, to catch me if I fall, or B, to like hold me up when I'm doing really, really good. Um, and so that's kind of courageous in like that broad spectrum. Um, in my life, we had 
me and my husband had a lot of moments where we got to choose to be courageous. Um, one is going through Financial Peace University that um, has changed our life and our marriage, but it's a really hard thing to go from not knowing what to do with our money and not really caring what to do, and then stepping into God's biblical um, principles and then actually doing it um, for us. We didn't do them so great uh, and this gazelle intense as Dave Ramsey always wants us to do it, but we did it and now we're debt free. And so that was super courageous because it would have been very easy to just stop what we're doing and be like everybody else and not take ownership and, and trust in God's uh, provision for us. And so that was another way of being courageous. I uh, really like how she gets after an important principle when it comes to courageous following. It's little things. Little right decisions made over and over and over again. I wasn't expecting her to talk on finances. That's interesting. I never associated that, uh, the two. To, it takes a lot of courage to trust God with your finances. And then she says the best thing they ever did. I want to talk with you for a few moments on some considerations when it comes to being a courageous follower of God, some things that you might do to begin to be a courageous follower of the Lord, because if courage moves us from slothfulness to diligence, then we need, we need to talk on that and how to do it. So I have some things I call the practice of courage here, but, but pick one of these, because they're just examples, and maybe God would have you begin to work in your life this way in terms of being a courageous follower. Um, First of all, choose biblical heroes. Choose biblical heroes in your life. Um, the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses who have gone before showing us how to courageously follow um, God. They need to become your heroes. And the story of courageous uh, followers didn't stop with what is recorded in Hebrews. There's all kinds of people that have gone before you that... Uh, have been a hero in their faith. Who are they? Model your life after them. Emulate them. Imitate them. Courageously pursuing God will mean that you and I will throw off distracting entanglements. There are habits and there are influence in your life that disconnect you. That they may not even seem that bad, but they just take valuable time and resources. They maybe occupy too much of your thinking. A big challenge for you and I today is technology. I tell you what, it is a friend and a foe. Amen? And I, I, I think it's okay to be on social media, but I want to encourage you fast from it every now and then. Don't answer your phone for a few hours. That's good for your soul. You don't have to see what's going on on Facebook or anything else. You'll be okay. Lay it down and actually look at the person you're with. Talk to them. Sort of novel, amen? amen. Have some time with, oh, somebody, yeah, you like that. <laughs> Other entanglements might be hobbies or preoccupation with food or watching way too many TV shows or maybe even a preoccupation with looks. These things distract. Throw them off. It takes courage to throw them off. Courageously following God means that you and I will pay attention to the little that often controls. The little that controls. See, dreams and visions get dismembered by a thousand interruptions. And just like technology is a friend or foe, it can be a friend or foe here too. Because right now, our technology has created an interrupted life. I wear a watch. Apple Watch. And you have Apple Watch? That means every time someone calls me, this thing rings. Good and bad. It's inevitable I'll be doing something and that thing will ring. And I'm in the middle of something. And I go, it takes me right out of what I'm in to saying, now what do I do here? Do I answer this or do I stay engaged with what I'm, I'm doing? You have to constantly ask yourself, what is the big thing God wants to do in my life? And you have to Put it in your calendar, and you have to pursue it with a vengeance, amen? Because all the little things will displace it. And if you have little ones running around, you've got more little things that will displace it, amen? But I felt called of God to go into ministry when I was 33 years old. 
I had six kids at home at the time. I was working at 3M as a plant engineering manager. I was so busy doing so many things, but God had this big, hairy goal for me to go after. And I remember I didn't eat lunch for five years, not with anybody else, because I did studying every lunch hour at 3M. And every Saturday morning, I got up before everybody else got up for a few hours and did that. Every Sunday night late, I did that studying because God was challenging me with this big goal. Are you satisfying for the too little in your life? That's my question for you. This isn't unique to me. God has things for us to pursue, and oftentimes the detriment to it is all these little things. And lastly, take a Sabbath rest. If you're going to courageously pursue God, you've got to take a Sabbath rest. You know, sloth may creep up on someone who never allows himself or herself to rest. And that's why you think, oh, I just want to retire so life will be easy. You might have a wrong view of retirement because you're not learning how to rest now in the Lord Jesus Christ and be rejuvenated and, 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 and recreated. Um, listen, you're not wired to go seven days a week without ever stopping to work, 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 work. Sometimes an illness, sometimes, you know, sickness is just a response of a work. Sometimes when you're daydreaming, you can't focus and you feel apathetic. It's because your mind's saying, I'm taking a Sabbath rest, even though you're not giving me one. I'm done. I'm shutting down here. And I think part of the problem we have in the world in general and in the church world is that we don't understand how to correctly re- generate weekly in the Lord Jesus Christ by letting our bodies have a break. Amen? And taking a Sabbath rest. The problem we face as Christ followers is everything that we do, I know this is my problem, is super important. So you think, I can't take a break? What will the kingdom do without me? It'll do just fine. You're no good to the kingdom of God if you're burnt out and tired, fried. So now we're to the virtue Diligence. I got to wrap up quick. Like usual, I'm going over time. Don't, don't look at the clock. If we actually are courageous followers of, of Lord Jesus Christ, it'll move us from, it'll displace slothfulness in our lives, and we'll, be, we'll move over to this virtue of diligence. Now, what diligence means, the definition of diligence is this, this, steadfast, earnest, and energetic effort. That's all diligence means, is a steadfastness, an earnestness and an energetic effort given to the Lord Jesus Christ. When you practice the courage I just articulated with you, guess where it moves you towards? Diligence. It just begins to happen. And slothfulness tends to go away. So I want to encourage you this morning. Be of good courage. Be strong in the Lord Jesus Christ. Diligently pursue him and his agenda. And the vice of sloth will lose its grip on you. And all of a sudden, you're, you're, you're over here experiencing what it means to be a diligent, earnest follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but the last seven weeks have been super challenging to me. How about you? If you've been around, maybe some of you, this is your first morning and you have no idea what we covered the last seven weeks. Well, go to our webpage, go to the media section, and you can look at the prior messages and see what we've covered and get up to speed. But have you been challenged? I, I've been so challenged. These have been hard messages to preach. I, I think I succumbed to slothfulness when it came to preaching this series. It's been 10 years I've been looking at these seven deadly sins thinking, I should do a series on these. For 10 years, I didn't make that decision. Because I thought, I don't know. It doesn't sound like it's very fun. <laughs> you know? And then this last year, I thought, I've been here long enough now. If I bomb out for a few weeks, they may still love me. But, you know, really when I looked at it, honestly, all joking aside, it's ironic because I think I succumbed to slothfulness. I was indecisive. It just put the decision off forever. <laughs> Saying, well, I should preach out of the Gospels or all these Old Testament books are really good. You know, there, there's always a good rationalization for it. But anyway, that's my issue. I'm getting too personal now. But be honest with yourself when it comes to this thing. It's more insidious than we think it is. Sometimes we just say it's indecision or I don't have enough information. Yeah. But oftentimes the reason we don't make a decision and do what we're supposed to do is simply because 
we're succumbing to the vice, the slothfulness. And God says, be of good courage. Make a decision. Be a person of action. Follow hard after the Lord Jesus Christ. Give him your life. Be passionate. You know, I always say it this way. Have a fire burning in your belly for Jesus. Amen? And when that fire is burning for Jesus in your belly, you're not going to be okay over here. You're going to want to move to this diligent side of the equation. So at this time, I'm going to dismiss Watertown to Pastor Jeff. He's going to close you guys with prayer and maybe a word or two on slothfulness himself. And for the rest of us here this morning, we're going to close with a word of prayer. Would you bow your heads, please, with me? Lord God, I I pray for us that you would just uh, do a work deep inside our souls. Jesus, I pray that you would... um, would just uh, prick our hearts this morning that it's not okay to be lukewarm, dispassionate, disconnected, apathetic, or to use today's terminology, slothful. Help us, Lord Jesus Christ, to be ones who are courageously following you, dealing with little things that entangle our lives, saying, no, they're not going to master me anymore. Um, You know, being one to have the right kind of biblical hero that we look at the life of somebody who's just been a a follower of you uh, that we admire, that we start modeling after them and making decisions like they would make decisions, Lord. And I pray that we learn how to do this cycle of Christianity where we know how to rest, but yet we know how to do great effort, Lord. And combining the two, Lord, we move and follow you in a courageous way so that we move under this kind of umbrella of the virtue of diligence that then, Lord, we would be ones who are experiencing what it means to be an earnest follower, making a real effort, Lord, being steadfast in you. God, may it be so by the filling of the person of the Holy Spirit today. And may you just grace us, Lord, to truly live this and experience it in our lives. Thank you for this church and their patience, Lord, and their love of you. God, would you bless each one, bless marriages, bless our children, bless relationships today. Fill us just with the love of Jesus. Burn in our bellies, Jesus, so that we can't help but live and move and have our being in you. God, we love you and we worship you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our minds, all of our strength. Who is like you? There's no one beside you. You're the creator of all things. You're the sustainer of all things. In you, uh, all things have their being and you all things are made known and we worship you today Lord and we exalt you and as we finish with this song today Lord God just do something deep in our souls would you just instill in us uh, this sturdiness this courage Lord to follow hard after you we pray these things in your name and by your blood Jesus and all God's people said